Hello, and welcome to our urinary system pre-lab. Okay, to start out with the urinary system, uh, the major organ that we're going to be looking at is going to be the kidney. And so if we take a look at the kidney, uh, it's going to have two distinct regions. It's going to have an outer region, which is going to be darker staining. Uh, it's going to have uh, a lot of things going on. on and it's going to be this outer region, which is going to be the cortex. Within this cortex, and again, if we think about this with this uh, representation of the nephron here, we're going to be looking at the renal corpuscles, and that's what we've got over here on the right-hand side. So we've got the capillary beds of the glomerulus here. We've got Bowman's capsule. We've got the urinary space, uh, the outer region of Bowman's capsule, uh, uh, vascular pole coming in here, and then lots and lots of convoluted tubules around it. Again, if we look at this on the uh, artist rendition, we've got the glomerular capillary bed, we have Bowman's capsule leading into the proximal convoluted tubule. As you can see, you've got all kinds of, of tubules all twisted around uh, within the cortex. It's going to go down into the loop of Henle, and when it's going down into the loop of Henle, we've got this dashed line right here, which represents the boundary between the cortex and the medulla. So it's going to go down into the medulla, come back up, but then back up here in the cortex, we're now going to have the distal convoluted tubule. So distal because it's a long ways away from where it started in this urinary space. And then we're going to have medullary rays, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. But the medullary rays are these collecting tubules and collecting ducts that are going to be running roughly parallel to one another, but running straight as opposed to these convoluted or twisted tubules that have got over here. Okay, we're also going to have the capillaries that can be found around the proximal and convoluted tubules, and these are going to be the paratubular capillaries. So the, the cortex is going to be from this dashed line on this representation up, uh, and so we've got a lot of stuff going on here. We take a look at the medulla. The medulla is going to be the inner region of the kidney. It's going to be lighter staining, and it's going to be more regular in appearance. So it's got lots of tubules, lots of ducts that are going to be present. And for the most part, they're all going to be running in the same orientation. So we're going to have lots and lots of loops of Henle. Uh, what we've got here, again, the same artist rendition. So we've got the dashed line here, the cortex to the top, the outer region. The medulla is inner region here. So we've got the loops of Henle all running relatively uh, in the same orientation. So one going down, the other going anti-parallel, going back up, but essentially going kind of up and down through the medulla. They're running in the same orientation as these collecting tubules and collecting ducts over here. And so what we're looking at then, if we look on the, the uh, histological image on the right-hand side, is kind of an even staining appearance. We don't see the, 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 the twisted tubes like we saw up in the cortex. We don't see the glomeruli. line. We don't see uh, the renal corpuscles. Uh, we don't see all of that stuff going on. Uh, what we're going to see is kind of a longitudinal section of uh, ducts and tubes kind of running through here, some loops of Henley probably scattered in here as well, or cross-section like we've got here. It's kind of an oblique section, which is why we see both longitudinal and cross-section within the same region. But if we look kind of in a, a single region, we're going to see all cross-section or all kind of longitudinal section, not the twisted sections like we're going to see up here within the cortex. Now, moving back up into the cortex, we can look at from a kind of functional standpoint. Uh, so subdivisions of the renal lobes uh, are going to be the renal lobules. And what's going to be defined as we're going to have a central medullary ray. And so if you look at this, we can see collecting tubules. They're running up and down kind of at this position here. Probably another set they're running up and down here. So they're all running roughly parallel to one another. And what we're going to have are these central medullary rays. And then we're going to have all of the nephrons. So we're going to have some glomeruli up here. So we've got a renal corpuscle, and the proximal convoluted tubules all twisted around, another renal corpuscle over here, another uh, renal corpuscle over here, all twisted around and ultimately going to drain into a central medullary ray. So we've got the nephrons and then the collecting tubules and collecting ducts within the medullary ray are going to represent these renal lobules. Now again, if we think about this from a functional standpoint, the nephron is going to be the functional subunit of the kidney, and this is going to be repeated over and over again throughout the kidney. You're going to have lots and lots of these structures present. So we're going to have the renal corpuscle, so we get an afferent arterial bringing our blood in, the glomerular capillary bed, efferent arterial carrying the, the blood out, urinary space enclosed within Bowman's capsule, directing that raw filtrate, that raw urine, into the uriniferous tubule. And the uriniferous tubule is going to be composed of the proximal convoluted tubule up here within the cortex, the loop of Henle going down within the medulla, and then the distal convoluted tubule. And you've got to remember that distal tubule is going to kind of wrap around and come back towards 
our glomerulus over here, our, our renal corpuscle over here. Ultimately, this is going to dump into the collecting tubules and collecting ducts. And the collecting tubules and collecting ducts aren't part of the nephron. It's just going to be the uh, renal corpuscle over here, the proximal tubule, the loop of handling, and then the distal tubule are going to be the nephrons. Okay, so if we take a look at this, again, an artist's rendition on the left-hand side, uh, nice, uh, in this case, a periodic acid shifts uh, histological specimen on the right. We can see essentially a, an artery coming in here, arterial, and another arterial there. So one of them is going to be the afferent, the other one's going to be the efferent. The efferent is usually going to be smaller because we're going to have a less volume going through because we're going to be squeezing out a lot of fluid and a lot of materials as it's going through this glomerular capillary bed. So a very rich capillary bed, fenestrated capillaries. You've got the podocytes, the inner layer of Bowman's capsule kind of surrounding it. Those interdigitations giving us the, the filtration barrier. It's going to squeeze small molecules out, fluid out into this urinary space. We've got the outer region of Bowman's capsule. And so we've got the vascular pole up here at this end, again, because the arterioles are coming in and exiting. Glomeruli, the capillary bed, urinary space, Bowman's capsule probably someplace over here directing it into uh, some of these uh, proximal tubules. Uh, so that's, that's basically what we're going to be dealing with with the renal corpuscle as a filtering mechanism. For some reason my mouse keeps skipping slides. Uh, the raw filtrate is going to go from Bowman's capsule in that urinary space into the proximal convoluted tubules. And so what we've got here is lots of these proximal convoluted tubules uh, throughout here. No clear demarcation between the cells because there's a lot of interdigitation between the cells. We're not going to see lots of boundaries between the cells. The cells are going to be kind of wide and flattened. Uh, they're still going to be probably simple cuboidal or low columnar, but we're not going to see a lot of nuclei around the lumen. And so that's a little strange compared to some of the other uh, simple cuboidal or, or simple columnar epithelia that we've seen. Um, the proximal convoluted tubules are going to be more eosinophilic than the distal tubules because we're going to be using a lot of mitochondria, a lot of ATP, for pumping ions from that raw filtrate, from that urinary space, from that lumen, into the body proper, bringing it back into the body and essentially rec uh, recycling it. We take a look at it, we're going to have a rough appearance to um, the lumen, and it's going to have a rough appearance because we're going to have a, what's referred to as a brush border. We get abundant microvilli along the surface. And again, the microvilli are present there to increase the surface area available for absorption. So lots of pumping of ions across the, the epithelial lining, lots of movement of materials, things like glucose, are going to be reabsorbed from that raw filtrate as it's passing through the proximal convoluted tubule. We're going to go down into the loop of Henle, again, diving down into the medulla. And so what we're going to see are going to be roughly uh, a bunch of tubules running in the same orientation and we're going to have some thicker limbs and some thinner limbs of the loop of Henle. Again, uh, the thick limbs are going to have a, a thicker epithelial lining, thinner limbs, a thinner, thinner epithelial lining, but still a, a simple probably cuboidal epithelial, uh, whether it's a, a normal cuboidal or a low cuboidal uh, epithelium as it's passing through the loop of Henle. And again, review the, the lecture notes and uh, the lecture video for the function of the loop of Henle, because we're basically going to establish an osmotic gradient uh, by the different properties between the descending and the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Coming back up into the cortex, we're going to go into the distal convoluted tubule. So that's the final segment of the nephron. And so what we're going to look at, again, is going to be a, a low cuboidal epithelia, smoother appearance to the lumen. Uh, and it's going to have a smoother appearance because there's no brush border. We don't have uh, microvilli along the surface. A lot of the absorption has been occurring in the proximal tubules. And in this image, two, uh, what the structure is labeled with two, you can see have that rough appearance of the lumen, have the brush border. Three, has a smoother appearance because of the, the lack of the microvilli. Because of the lack of microvilli, because of the structure of these things, looks like we're going to have a wider lumen in these distal tubules. More nuclei, uh, still not a lot of uh, cell boundaries because there's a lot of interdigitation that's going to be going on. So there's, there's boundaries between these cells, but we can't tell that because uh, of the way the cells are, are coming into contact with one, one another. It's not a nice straight boundary. It's a lot of zigzagging here, which makes it a little bit more difficult to see. Uh, more basophilic than the proximal convoluted tubules. More nuclei because the, the cells are a little bit uh, packed in together uh, when we take a look at them.
Now, one of the structures associated with both our, our uh, renal corpuscle and our, our proximal convoluted tubule is the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Juxta for near glomeruli for the glomerular capillary bed. We're going to be looking at a structure that's going to be located near the vascular pole, and it's going to be combined by the afferent arterial carrying the blood in, in this case, nine uh, over here, and the structure here, C, which is going to be our distal convoluted tubule. And this is going to be uh, composed of juxtaglomerular cells, uh, these cells over here, these greenish cells in six, as well as macula densa cells, these pink cells here within the wall of the uh, distal uh, tubule. In this case, we're going to have a lot of nuclei packed very close to one another, located right up against the vascular pole uh, of a, a renal corpuscle, and that's going to be identifying the uh, macula densa. The juxtaglomerular cells are often going to be more difficult to identify uh, when we take a look at it in uh, a normal hematoxin eosin or histological specimen. You'd be able to identify it in electron microscopy, but it, it's a little bit harder. Uh, but you should be able to identify uh, the macula densa. We also have some uh, extra glomerular uh, mesangial cells, which are essentially going to be involved with holding the juxtaglomerular apparatus together. Now, once the materials that uh, raw filtrate has been processed, we've recycled, we've reclaimed the materials from that raw filtrate, we're going to have a more mature form of urine. And it's going to dump from that nephron into a series of collecting tubules and collecting ducts. And now in this case, we're going to have a block-like epithelium. So uh, a simple cuboidal epithelium in the smaller tubules going to a simple columnar uh, epithelium in the larger duct system. So clear boundaries between the cells, kind of a normal appearance, so one cell, one nuclei, clear boundaries between the cells as we're taking a look at it. So it's going to have a nice block-like appearance that we've seen in other kind of classic examples of simple cuboidal or simple columnar epithelia. Remember, these are going to start out when in the, the medullary rays, and essentially collecting the, the, the urine from the nephrons as it's uh, passing through the cortex, but then it's going to go down into larger duct systems, uh, collecting ducts, as it's passing through the medulla. And again, keep in mind that the properties of the collecting ducts are going to change, determining whether or not they're going to be permeable to water. And if they're permeable to water, that water is going to be passing through the epithelial lining. And so what's going to happen is we're going to concentrate the urine, so a low volume of urine, but it's going to be very, very concentrated, or it's going to pass through directly with uh, pass through the collecting tubules, collecting ducts without being modified in order that it's essentially going to produce a large volume of very dilute urine. And again, review the properties associated with that. It's related to the, the presence or absence of ADH. Now the ureters are going to drain the urine from the renal pelvis uh, and carry it to the urinary bladder. And so we're going to be lined by a transitional epithelium, and so it's going to be uh, many cell layers thick, surface cells are going to be nucleated, rounder nuclei along the surface, kind of dome-shaped cells, and so what we're going to see is essentially a muscular tube around the outside, so you've got a muscularis out here, and then the transitional epithelium, and that's going to be the major characteristic that we're looking at uh, as the ureters. We get down into the urinary bladder, and it's the same basic setup except instead of a, a muscular tube, we're going to be looking at a muscular stack, muscular sac. Uh, so it's essentially distensible where it's able to stretch out as it fills with urine. Again, a nice transitional epithelia in this case, so we can see it's a striated, or not striated, a, uh, sorry, it's a uh, stratified epithelium. Multiple cell layers thick, surface cells are nucleated, round nuclei as opposed to minimally keratinized stratified squamous, but dome-shaped cells. Uh, relatively dense lamina propria underlying it, and then a thicker muscularis outside so that the, uh, essentially the muscles can constrict and uh, empty the bladder. And that finishes up our overview of the urinary system. Uh, hopefully you can now take a look at the slides associated with this, answer the questions involved with that. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at Thank you.